Hello, this is Tammy Jo Schultz and Kelly Murphy, a friend of mine at Women Aviation International, asked if I would have time to read a little bit. And so I always have time to read. It is my favorite hobby. And so I, I love sharing it with you. Today we're gonna to read out of my book, Nerves of Steel. This is the junior reader. And one of the reasons I was so excited about doing a junior reader is it was in junior high that I decided to fly. Uh, and I think that's because when, when we're in junior high, we still have the wonder of a child about us, but we're putting on that adult brain and we're starting to think about what do I want to do in life? Where do I see myself in 10 years, in 20 years? And it's never too early or too late to plan. So let's get started. We're up in our screened in porch at our house. Now I admit I couldn't keep up with all the dirt when it was screened in. So we finally put windows in it and now it's one of my favorite rooms in the house. Nerves is steel. To the brave hearts aboard flight 1380 and to the extraordinary team of professionals that supported us that day both in the air and on the ground. Next page is one of my favorite poems. You'll see why as you read the book. He who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight, in the long way that I must tread alone, will lead my steps aright. William Cullen Bryant, in To a Waterfowl. Prologue. New York's LaGuardia Airport is a bit tricky for airline pilots. LGA, as we call it, can be like quicksand, easy to get stuck in. Fortunately, today is not one of those days, and it looks like my first officer and I are going to escape the LGA trap without any worries. Our plane pushes back from the gate on time, and we taxi out to runway 31 and are cleared for takeoff without having to pause. First, It's first officer Darren Elliser's turn to fly, so I get us lined up and give him the controls. He pushes the throttles up and we're off. The city quickly falls away below us. We point our nose southwest and settle in for a four hour flight to Dallas Love Field in Texas. What a beautiful day to fly. But about 20 minutes into the flight, as we climb to 32,000 feet over Eastern Pennsylvania, this beautiful day turns ugly. Boom. Something explodes like an artillery shell, and it feels like our plane has been hit. A quick look at the cockpit gauges tells me that our left engine is dead. This isn't good, but it's manageable. I've been practicing single engine failures in the flight simulator for 24 years. A fraction of a second later, not good becomes not good at all. The jet, a Boeing 737-700, quickly, quickly rolls off to the left. The nose jerks hard and drops into a dive. Darren and I both lunch for the controls. Something more than an engine failure has happened. But what? Then a bone-jarring shudder runs through the aircraft and chaos takes over. The air pressure plummets and Darren and I can't breathe. Just as the air is sucked out of our lungs, the air conditioning system pulls gray smoke into the cockpit. A sharp pain pierces our ears. A deafening roar vibrates so hard that our instruments become a crazy blur. An incredible invisible power continues to pull our 737 toward the ground. We've never practiced this in the simulator before. First, we need our oxygen masks. Amid the confusion, time seems to slow down. I can't see, I can't hear, and I can't breathe. My heart races, but my thoughts become very clear. This isn't the first time I've been in an out of control aircraft. It isn't the first time I've flown without all the information I need. It isn't the first time I've brushed up against disaster. This is a good news, bad news situation and the bad news first, always. I'm not sure the left wing can take much more of the abuse caused by the exploded engine and its damage this might be the day I meet my maker, face to face. The good news, we're still flying. It's time to get to work. That finishes prologue, the prologue. 
I'm going to have a sip of tea before we get started on chapter one. I do have one weakness that I admit to, and that is hot tea. My earliest memories are of wide open skies. Sorry, I didn't read you. The title to chapter one is No Second Class Citizens. And I think that's one of those things that we learn when we're young in life. Or we should learn when we're young in life. My earliest memories are of wide open skies. Big and blue, they sprawled over the small town of Farmington, New Mexico, where I was born in 1961. The gorgeous sunset and bright moon rose over high, flat mesas that look as if they had been painted with watercolors. I guess most of my memories are of what was above me, because when you're little, you're always looking up. I looked up to my parents first. As I started school, they moved our family to a five-acre farm near Florida Mesa, Colorado, in the southwest corner of the state. Dad worked there as a grader operator, building country roads and making ski slopes for the nearby resort. My dad was tall and could whistle like no one else I knew. There were super, those were superhero qualities in my eyes. Mom was always cooking or canning our home grown vegetables, milking cows or feeding chickens. She also sewed most of our sis, my sister and my sisters and my clothes. If we needed a tractor driver while we loaded hay, then she drove the tractor too. Dwight was my older brother by 13 months. Sandra, my sister, was born a year and a half after me. From the beginning, we knew Sandra wasn't like everyone else, but we didn't know until she was nine that she had cerebral palsy a disorder that affects a person's muscle movements and brain development. Mom and Dad sold cream from our cow's milk to buy piano lessons, a true luxury for Dwight and me. The day we got our piano was the first day we ever heard our mom play. It was drop your lunch pale beautiful, even to a first grader. Each day we had to practice before we could go out to play. Mom sweetened her practice before play rules by saying, Piano practice will make your fingers faster. You'll be able to catch more frogs, which was Dwight and I's uh, idea of a true hobby. In our home, we could change instruments, but you could never quit. Sandra didn't play the piano, but she loved to sing with others. Drawing and needlework were her style of fun. Dad seemed to always be working, but he found time to make child-sized wooden guitars from strips of plywood nails and thin, thin silver wire. Dwight, Sandra, and I took these treasures to our hideouts where we strummed and sang as if it sounded good. Childhood was happy because my family was happy. We lived simply on our farm, raising our crops, tending livestock, and being fed by both. We were always raising a pig and a calf, usually undersized runts. One of the runt pigs we took under our wing was especially cute and clever. She loved to chew gum. When given a piece, she would pace and stamp at the screen door of our house with impatient little grunts waiting to be let in. The family would gather for the show, then open the door while one of us gave a running commentary of the little pig's actions. After trotting in, she would set her haunches down in the middle of the hallway rug, put her nose straight up in the air, and smack loudly with her eyes closed. When the flavor was gone, she spit out the gum and headed back outside. When it came to chores, Dwight and I both bucked hail, bales of hay on and off a hay trailer, mucked out stalls and fertilized the garden, milked cows and mended fences. When we were older, we moved sections of sprinklers across acres of alfalfa and cut and baled hay. On weekends, we ground our livestock feed, milo, wheat, and some alfalfa, the dustiest, loudest job on the farm. As hard as the work was, it was nice that we could pick some of our own chores. Dwight liked the mechanical side of farming and ranching. I preferred the animals. But no matter what we chose, we each had about two solid hours of chores every day. My parents made sure we had time for fun too. Dwight and I explored. We dug for imaginary pirate treasure. We searched for magpie nests up among the upper branches of the trees to see what bird the birds had collected. 
We built forts between the juniper tree trunks and made pies, exploded dirt clods against the barn wall, and threw pitchforks into the haystack. Catching critters was our favorite pursuit. Dwight and I played constantly, and we fought constantly too. We had opposite personalities and often approached tasks in opposite ways. When we were draining the sprinkler pipes, or could, whether we were draining the sprinkler pipes or corralling the horses, I wanted to catch the animals, Dwight wanted to let them go. He liked speed, I wanted to take my time. Many times our disagreements turned into an all out war. We threw dirt or rocks at each other and sometimes even swung fists, but our arguments never kept us apart for long. Every Thursday, my mom baked eight loaves of white bread, one for each day of the week and one to be eaten right out of the oven, dripping with homemade honey butter. That was our favorite treat, far better than the snacks Dwight and I would pilfer from the barrel full of dog food in the well house. We were never starving, of course, but we liked to pretend like we were shipwrecked and needed any kind of food to survive. The nuggets of dog food gave us a sense of independence and also helped keep our German Shepherd lady close by while we were on our adventures. I'll admit, we tried a few bites as we wandered the woods of Florida Mesa. At least we knew if we were ever lost in the wilderness, we wouldn't die of hunger. Our family moved a few times. When I was in fourth grade, mom and dad took us to, a, to Bayfield, Colorado, another nearby ranching town. They bought a sow with piglets and joined a hawk corporation, which held the promise of more cash. Though dad still drove a grader in, Durang in the Durango area, he and mom worked for, from dun, <laughs> dawn to, till dusk, I can read, around the 17 acre farm. For the first three months, we lived in a camper while we repaired the house on the property to make it livable. Life in the camper thrilled me. We kids would eat and then scatter outside until the time for the next meal. No house chores. The property was a kid's paradise. We had a frog pond that fed into a larger pond. The big pond had been stocked years earlier with brown and rainbow trout, but it had never been fished. Apple trees lined the pond's west side and a small dock was on the south end. Dad built a raft for us out of barrels and planks. He attached a rope to it so that it ran to the dock and we would be able to fish and splash around from, from that. Then there were endless tadpoles to raise caught from the pond across. From the big pond that had fish in it. With the apple trees nearby, we soon lost interest in the dog food. Just one year later, Dad received an offer to partner with a cousin on a pig farm and cattle ranch in Tularosa, New Mexico, about 400 miles south. It was Dad's dream to ranch full-time, so we moved again. Our new farm had a brick house, a barn for milk cows, a hay barn, an equipment barn, a farrowing house, where cows, excuse me, where sows would give birth to piglets and various corrals for calves and horses. Around us, the landscape was flat with mesquite bushes and sandy soil. When the wind blew, which was very often, the sand piled around the mesquite bushes, creating big mounds of sand and thorns. Our house was isolated. We had no close neighbors, no television, no computers, not even a phone. But I loved this new chapter in life and mom and dad were both home working. In that arid land where heat waves blurred the horizon, each of us kids got a pony. A brown and white pony was loitering in our alfalfa field when we moved in. We named him Brighty and he became Sandra's. Mine was a paint Shetland mix we called Little Boy. Dwight's pony was a gray dapple named Maggie. For fun and adventure, Dwight and I would ride for miles around our land. It seldom rained in southern New Mexico in the summer, but when it did, it was often a downpour. Sheets of water, thunder, and lightning. After it rained, sheets of water, thunder, and, and lightning. After the lightning passed, we'd climb on our horses and go exploring. 
Rain would flood the hard-packed earth, causing animals to pop out of their burrows in search of higher ground. Rabbits, coyotes, rattlesnakes, tarantulas, bobcats, ground squirrels. It was like riding through a desert zoo. When it snowed, we'd follow animal tracks to discover where they lived. Sandra sometimes came on rides with us, but she never liked to go far. Her pony knew the way home. So whenever she was finished exploring, Sandra simply turned around and Bridie would take her back home. It seemed new babies were constantly being born on our place. There were piglets, calves, chicks everywhere. Chicks hatching, I should say, everywhere. So we should have realized what was happening when mom started looking bigger and skinnier at the same time. Dwight, Sandra, and I drew straws to see who would ask mom about her oddly increasing size. I drew the short straw. One morning before church, I made my way to her bedroom and complimented her on her hair, her dress, and then I took a deep breath and mentioned she seemed to be growing. She chuckled. That was 1972 when I was 11, and a month later, our little brother, Deshane, was born. Our childhood home was full of love. Our parents needed, treated all of us alike with respect, responsibility, and freedom. No one was a second-class citizen in our home. But school was an entirely different world. That's the end of chapter one. And give us some feedback so we know if we want to keep going and discover some other books or continue in this one. But you all, I hope have a good day. I know some of you are on extended break right now or possibly online schooling and that can be kind of isolating. So I hope you'll take time to plan a game night with your friends, um, your neighbors, and don't just stick with your own age group. I'm telling you, it is so much fun to have peer pressure from a different group of peers. So go younger, go older, and enjoy Enjoy the people that are around you. All right, stay well and have a good day.